Welcome. Tonight we are talking about money and power. And here with us is Hedrick Smith, a former New York Times reporter with a 26-year tenure and a member of the Pulitzer Prize-winning member team that produced the Pentagon Papers series. He, his most recently published book is Who Stole the American Dream? And Yaron Brook, the executive director of the Ayn Rand Institute, a columnist at Forbes.com, contributing editor of The Objective Standard, and a weekly guest on Front Page, hosted by PJTV. Brook co-authored Free Market Revolution. Our theme, one of the central debates of our time, what is the role of money, power, and the proper place of government in our modern society? What should the role of government be? What problems exist and what is the best way forward to fix them? Our format proceeds as follows. Mr. Smith and Mr. Brook will each begin with opening statements, followed by a discussion between the two of them. At about 7.15, we will open up the mic to audience participation for questions for about 40 minutes. We will conclude with closing statements. I look forward to a vigorous and civil debate and dialogue. <laughs> we begin with Mr. Smith. Rachel and Ms. Cobb, thank you very much for your, your introduction, and I want to thank the Ford Hall Forum for sponsoring this debate tonight. It's a critical debate at a critical time. I think we all know that our country's in trouble, and by that I don't mean just the showdown in Washington about the shutdown. We have a society now which has greater divisions of economic inequality than we've had in the last 40 years or so. We have a starkly unequal democracy in which uh, is dominated considerably by the power of money, uh, particularly the money of concentrated wealth. We have a dispute over the Citizens United decision and whether or not corporations should, as organizations and other unions and so forth, be able to make political donations. I really want to talk about the evolution of American capitalism and American democracy over the last 30 or 40 years. I don't think the question of democracy or capitalism is at stake here. The question is, have we moved from what was a workable democracy and a very workable and successful form of capitalism back in the 40s, 50s, 60s, and 70s to one that is unequal and, and unworkable? Have we gone from a bipartisan uh, democracy in which Washington could pass not only budgets every year but major pieces of legislation like Medicare and the Civil Rights Act to a point where it is so gridlocked that it cannot pass budgets, not just at the moment in the shutdown, but it cannot pass budgets year after year. Uh, and where we have a situation in the economy where over the last 39, 40 years, from 1979 to 2011, 84% of the nation's total growth in money income went to the top 1%. Let me repeat that, 84% of the total growth from 1979 to, to 2011 went to the top 1%. Where not just Paul Krugman and Joe Stiglitz, economists uh, on center left, but Citibank said, we are now witnessing the greatest inequality of any major power since 16th century Spain. Now, things weren't that way before, and in my book, Who Stole the American Dream?, I was trying to understand how we moved from what was a pretty successful democracy in an economy in which um, the wealth and prosperity that was generated by economic growth was widely shared, and the middle class participated. Economists think about it now almost as though we've become two Americas. There's, there's an enormous divide among us, both economically and politically. Uh, economists talk about the earlier period as the period of great convergence. Richard Nixon uh, and his famous kitchen debate with Nikita Khrushchev in 1959 actually said that America had a classless society. Now, Nixon was exaggerating, of course. The CEO of General Motors made 40 times as much as a worker on the General Motors assembly line. But what they mean by uh, c great convergence was the incomes at the top were not that far from the incomes in the middle, were not that far from the incomes at the bottom. What was really remarkable when I went back and did the research was to discover that the productivity of the American workforce for the 30 years after World War II, from 45 to the mid-70s, almost doubled. It grew by 97 percent. 
the household income of the median household, the average household in America during that period rose 95%. 97% growth in productivity, 95% growth at the middle. Economic wealth and growth was widely shared. Economists have studied that period in terms of the quintiles, the top 20%, the second 20%, all the way down to the bottom 20%. All five quintiles moved up in their income during that period. And the bottom ones actually moved up faster than the ones at the top. In addition to that, hard to remember, hard to believe, at that time corporations generated and gave such benefits to their employees that in 1980, 84% of the people who worked for companies with more than 100 employees got fully paid lifetime pensions from their employers. 70% got fully paid health benefits. So the wealth was widely shared, and it was widely shared, I believe, for a couple of reasons. One is the business leaders at that time believed it was smart. It was fair in the economy, but it was smart business. If you paid a lot of workers, tens of millions of workers, good wages, they would go out and spend the money. That money would generate demand, which would generate the next cycle of growth. Economists call that the virtuous circle of growth. High production, high wages, high demand pushes new production, new factories, new equipment. Uh, we've broken that cycle since then, but that was, that was uh, remarkable. It, read people like Charlie Wilson, the head of General Motors, Reg Jones, the head of, uh, of General Electric and others, and they said it was the sacred trust, sacred trust of the CEO to balance the economic interests of all the stakeholders in the corporation. And by that they meant the owners, the managers, the workers, the suppliers, the banks, the creditors, the customers, the communities they operated. They balanced that. They also considered it insider trading for them to trade in the stock of their own company because obviously they had special information about what their company was going to do. A very different ethic than we have today. Uh, it was also a time of middle class power. A very strong labor movement able to counterbalance the power of large corporations. A women's movement that said women are being paid 41% of, of what men are being paid for the same work. A consumer's movement that demanded uh, improvements in the quality of products. Uh, Ralph Nader wrote a book saying uh, GM and other American automakers were making cars that were defective. Brakes were failing, axles were failing, tires were exploding, people were getting hurt and killed in accidents caused by the industrialists themselves. And so there was pressure on the government and therefore pressure on industry to improve and protect the consumers more. Uh, there was an environmental movement. Uh, there was a peace movement. The middle class exercised power and had tremendous influence on Washington. Environmental movement, 20 million people in April uh, of 1970 went and demonstrated on Earth Day, demanded the cleaning up of uh, the water and the airways. And guess what? Within a year, Congress passed the Clean Air Act, the Clean Water Act, the Safe Drinking, Wa the Safe Drinking Water Act, the Anti-Toxic Substances Act, all signed by that great environmental president, Richard Nixon. Why did Nixon do it? Because of practical politics. Uh, that was from Bill Ruckel's house. Now, what happened? What happened to that picture? We had a watershed, and I thought the watershed, uh, as a reporter for the New York Times, I thought the watershed occurred under Ronald Reagan in the early 1980s. When I went back and checked the history, I found that it actually started in 1978 under Jimmy Carter and the Democrats. <laughs> What happened was a backlash among the business leaders who had felt the pressure from the consumer movement, the women's movement, the labor movement, the environmental movement. Lewis Powell, named to the Supreme Court by Richard Nixon, was so disturbed that he wrote a memo, uh, so disturbed about the middle class power, about the increasing regulation of business, wrote a memo to the U.S. Chamber of Commerce, which they circulated to business leaders around the country, and said, business, you're being taken to the cleaners in the political arena. You need to organize, you need to move to Washington, you need to pool your money, you need to develop a long-term plan. And what's astonishing is that happened, not because Powell was so influential, but because there were a lot of business leaders who were frustrated. We had the revolt of the bosses. There were 175 companies that had offices in Washington in 1971 when Powell wrote his memo. Eight years later, there were 2,400. There were 50,000 people working for business trade associations. There were 9,000 registered corporate lobbyists. And that army, Powell's army, went to work. And under Carter, they blocked labor legislation. They blocked Consumer Protection Bureau that was wanted by Ralph Nader and the consumer movement. They got the 401k plan put in in place of 
lifetime pensions from companies that evolved over time. They got the corporate bankruptcy law changed to the advantage of management, so management could rip up labor contracts by going to bankruptcy courts. They got the capital gains tax rate sharply reduced. They got the corporate tax rate reduced, and they began the process of deregulation, deregulation of the trucking industry, deregulation of the telecommunications industry, and it goes on deregulation begins in the banking industry in late 1980, carries on in the early early 1980s under Reagan. We've got the, just a few minutes sure. left. Right. So what we have is a political power shift that clearly influenced policy in the subsequent years. And in the economy, we moved from stakeholder capitalism to shareholder capitalism. Shareholder capitalism being delivered to the shareholders, and that means pressure. Uh, on workers' wages, and you begin to see a wedge develop. Workers' wages, male workers' wages, from 1978 to 2011, adjusted for inflation, were dead even. Now remember, that's at the same time that 84% of the nation's monetary gains are going to the top 1%. You begin to see the disconnect between the advance of the economy and the living standard of middle-class Americans. Productivity goes up 80%, average household income goes up only 10%, and mostly because more women work more hours. So what we've seen is a, is a disconnect uh, and a dysfunctionalism coming into our capitalist system over the last 30 or 40 years, largely because of deregulation in government policies, policies that favored corporations and favored the rich, tax policies and other policies, and also because of a change in the mindset of American business leaders and what their objectives were, and actually the teaching in American business schools. I and need what a we're break left in. Oh, what? Finish your sentence and then yeah. I'm gonna break in. And, and what we're left with is an economy that has broken that virtuous cycle of growth. And we're now stuck with very slow growth. And the reason is not lack of capital. At least the reason is we don't have adequate demand because the middle class consumers are not being paid the same share of the economic pie that they used to be paid at a time of prosperity. It might seem surprising to some that your argument hinges on a Democratic president and a Democratic Congress. And Congress was, was dominated by Democrats until 1994. So what was it about the Democratic Party that, which we don't necessarily associate with being pro-business, that enabled this to happen? What happened was after the Watergate scandal in 1974, there were a number of Democrats who got elected to Congress in 1976 in districts that had previously been Republican. And they were extremely vulnerable to pro-business lobbying. And, and this is where Powell's army went to work. They went to work on these Democrats, particularly in the House of Representatives, um, to move them. And what's interesting is you actually see <laughs> under Nixon and Ford, Republican presidents, you sort of had an anti-business Congress, which was passing a lot of regulatory legislation. And in the late 70s, under the Democrats, you begin to see deregulation start. And it, it has to do with, with this power shift. And it has to do also with the influence of lobbyists. I mean, I talked to Tip O'Neill about this, the former Speaker of the House, and he said to me, I've never seen a lobbying blitz like this in all my years in Congress. So this was the birth of modern lobbying in, in terms of the Washington power game. You begin to see it in the late 1970s. And the concentration of power, the, the, the ability of businesses to be able to target specific members of Congress and to rally business leaders in the districts of those specific members of Congress was enormously effective. We now take that kind of lobbying for granted, but prior to that, we did not have anything like that. So it was, partly it was their vulnerability, partly it was the effectiveness of Powell's army. Thank you very much. I'm gonna turn the floor over to Mr. Brooke. Thank you. Yeah. Good evening. It's great to see a packed house. Uh, thank you, and thank uh, thank uh, Fort Hope Forum for putting this on. Um, I find myself in a in a difficult position here. Um, my political philosophy is so different than Mr. Smith's uh, political philosophy that I have to somewhat backtrack before I challenge the history, the causality, and the facts, which ninety percent of which I disagree with that we just heard. So I'm not going to cover, uh, I'm not going to be able to get to all of that, so I encourage you to ask questions in, uh, in, in the Q&A uh, about inequality, about, about the causal relationship, and so on. So it should be fun. Um, power and money. 
So what are we talking about here? What kind of power? What does money have to do with this? What power does money actually represent? What power are we concerned with? Why is power a bad thing? So let me tell you what kind of power I'm concerned with, I believe is bad, I believe needs to be limited. That is the power to coerce. I think what makes a civilized country civilized, what makes a free country free, is when we limit or eliminate the power of individuals to coerce each other. A civilized country is a country in which we eliminate the power of individuals to coerce, to force, to use physical force on one another. Now, what is the entity in human history most responsible for coercing individuals? Well, it's government. And of course, the founders of this country recognize that. And that's why they wrote a constitution to limit the power of government. Government, by its very nature, is force. Government is the power to coerce. And the question is, what kind of power do we want government to engage in? Now, I believe that the principles at the heart of the founding of this country, at least in, in, in theory, maybe not so much in practice, was the idea that government is there only to protect us. The government is there only to protect us from our neighbor coercing us. The government is there never to initiate force, but only to be there as retaliation, as protector, as policeman, military, judge. But that's it. So to me, government's only role, again, is to protect us from the coercion of others, to protect us from the physical damage that people using physical force or fraud against us exert. Now, we've moved a long way from that kind of political power. Now, that is the essence of political power. The essence of political power is force. The essence of political power is the use of force. The American system is a system in which that is done in self-defense, in retaliation, never the initiation of force. But we've moved a long way from that. Today, government is the main coercer. Government coerces us daily. It redistributes wealth on a massive and ever-increasing scale. Uh, we, we didn't hear about that, of course, since the, since the late 1960s to today. Government is engaged in massive redistribution of wealth that it had never practiced in, in the past. Maybe that has something to do with the decline in economic activity. Since the 1970s, government is engaged in another form of coercion, massive business regulations. Uh, Nixon was at the forefront of this, uh, as was described. But, but this starts in the 1930s and, of course, accelerates over time uh, and has accelerated over the last few decades even more. So counter to mythology, uh, uh, leftist mythology, uh, uh, George Bush was responsible for massive increases in business regulation over the Elvis eight-year presidency. That is coercion. The, the fact that in order to shampoo hair today in California, you need a government license, that is coercion. And who does that hurt? Not the 1%. That is a direct attack on the 99%. Maybe that has something to do with the lack of economic activity when government is so restricting our ability to engage in free economic activity. So, in my ideal society, government has very little, government does no coercion. Government defends. It doesn't redistribute, and it doesn't regulate. It doesn't force its citizens. It protects them. It is their servant in protection of them against other people's force. Now, there's another kind of power which is indicated by the fact that we're putting money and power together. And that we call economic power. Now, economic power is fundamentally different than political power. Economic power has nothing to do with coercion. Economic power is attained voluntarily. Bill Gates makes $70 billion, that's about his wealth, by voluntarily exchanging value for value with his customers. He sells a product, you buy it. You don't want his product, 
don't buy it. You're buying it because the product is worth more to you than the money you're paying for it. It's worth less to Bill Gates. He has a profit. He accumulates those profits. He hasn't taken from anybody. He hasn't cursed anybody. He hasn't used physical force or fraud on anybody. Yet he's worth $70 billion. Economic power is not coercion. Again, it is voluntary. It is based on productivity. It is based on offering values. It is based on skill. It is based on talent. It's based on hard work. A society that rewards hard work, skill, and talent is a society in which some people make more than others. It's a society that by its nature is going to be unequal. Inequality is something to be celebrated. It's wonderful to have unequal. Imagine if we were all the same. How boring would that be? And, of course, societies that have tried that out haven't succeeded too well, uh, you know, across the board. So economic power is generated by creating values other people want and by selling those values. Now, this to me is justice. This to me is social justice. People like the term social justice. Social justice is an economy free of coercion where people get based on what they produce, based on the values that they create. They trade those values. Some prosper, some don't. Some choose not to prosper. You know, I got a PhD in finance. I chose to teach rather than go to Wall Street. I chose not to prosper because not everything, <laughs> financially, because not everything's about money. I mean, I know it's hard to believe, but I find it interesting that many people on the other side focus obsessively about money, but life's not about money. Life's about lots of things, it's about satisfaction, about happiness, about fulfillment. Uh, money's nice, but money's not everything. So justice, a just society, is a society in which we all have the opportunity to go and pursue our dreams. The opportunity free of coercion, free of anybody's coercion, other people's coercion, government coercion, to pursue the profession we want in the way that we want it, to trade value with value with other people in the society we're in. You're looking at me like I'm running out of time. I have a follow-up. Yes. So give us an example of, for the college student here today, how is it that they are w being coerced? Well, if I want to uh, go shampoo hair today and I go and open up a shop in, in California and, and shampoo somebody's hair without a license, I get arrested. That's called coercion, right? So that's force used upon me. Or, for example, if I decide that I don't feel charitable this year and I'm not going to pay my taxes, I will go to jail. Or if I uh, devise a new derivative and don't ask the regulator to sign off on it, I will go to jail. Every... You know, every one of your activities in the marketplace today is controlled by some coercive law that is not preventing you from defrauding other people. By shampooing somebody's hair, I'm not defrauding them. It's not protecting anybody. It's there to control me. Of course, we know why you need licensing to shampoo hair. You know, who lobbied for that? <laughs> people who already shampoo hair. They don't want competition. Uh, licensing laws all over the place, licensing laws are always lobbied for by the people who are established because they don't want the competition uh, from other people. So my view, laws should protect us against crooks, criminals, fraudsters. That's it. Not against bad decisions, not against bad judgments, not, a bad, not against um, you know, ignorance. Laws are there to protect us against violation of our right to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. And that involves l the only thing that can restrict our ability to pursue our life, to pursue our happiness, is force. It's the use of coercion against us. The, 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 our path to life, our path to happiness, is the use of reason in our mind. Reason and the human mind need freedom. Freedom of what? Freedom from coercion in order to thrive. The only role of government is to protect us from that coercion. Thank you. Okay, now we will have a...
give our 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 two folks well, time to respond. Okay, uh, I just have a little trouble getting into the world that Aaron Brook is describing. Um, it's a little bit of a virtual halcyon world of everybody pursuing life in a sort of perfect harmony, and we're all just pursuing our own interests. Uh, and the only villain is government coming in, cracking down on us. Now, I, and, and all the economic activity is just exchange of value. So let me just recite a few of the things that I ran into here uh, doing the research for this book. Uh, the companies Bear Stearns and Lehman Brothers were two of the biggest investment houses on, on Wall Street, and they collapsed in the financial crisis. And the leaders of those companies uh, walked away with $1.5 billion in cash and stock option bonuses while the shareholders were left with nothing. Now, the shareholders weren't coerced, but they sure got deprived of life, liberty, and happiness in terms of that. And there was no law of fraud that went and caught these guys. Uh, and there was nothing to protect people uh, from this happening. In, in Washington Mutual, which was the largest bank failure in American history, the internal investigators in Washington Mutual went and looked at the operations of some of their biggest offices in Southern California, and they found out that in one office, 58% of the mortgage loan applications were fraudulent, and 80% of the loan applications in another office were fraudulent, and all of the fraud was done internally, not by the borrowers, but by the people inside the the office uh, of Washington Mutual. But Washington Mutual did nothing to punish, discipline, or control those people from cheating customers and cheating the people who had invested in the bank. In fact, it sent the leaders of those two offices to the President's Club in Hawaii and gave them national awards. Um, we had five major Wall Street banks recently pay a $25 billion settlement for, for improperly and fraudulently, in some cases, uh, evicting people with foreclosures from their homes. And now the attorney generals are going back and looking at those banks for not abiding by their promise to actually handle the banking honestly. There are other major banks that have just agreed to pay $2.5 billion in fines because, listen to this, they manipulated LIBOR. Do you know what LIBOR is? The London Interbank Overnight Interest Rate. It is the rate set that sets interest rates all around the country, all around the world. Other interest rates are based on that. Your car loan, your mortgage rate, your student loan interest rate are based on something, LIBOR plus some percent. The banks found out that if they manipulate LIBOR by very, very small percentages, they could make hundreds of billions of dollars of profit. So the traders called in and they, they reported false information to LIBOR. They manipulated LIBOR. There is no way in the world ordinary consumers, not even other bankers, could find out about this. This is everybody pursuing uh, their own private freedom and, and, and making the economic system work better. Uh, we've got J.P. Morgan now about to pay 11 or $12 billion in another settlement for mishandling mortgages. Uh, we had during the, the stock option craze where, where business leaders were being paid stock options hundreds, sometimes a million shares of stock options a year. They get paid a stock at a certain price, say the price of the company is $40, and the idea is if you pay them stock and the company does well and the stock price goes up to $50 and they've got a million shares, they cash them in and they can make $10 million. Well, there are a whole lot of companies that didn't do that. The stock actually backed up to 35 or 32 or 33, and this CEO said, wait a minute, we're not getting our stock option bonuses. How about giving us new stock options at $28 or $22? So even though the stock went down and the price for the shareholders was worse, the CEOs were doing better. There were over 800 major American companies, including Apple and Steve Jobs, that artificially manipulated and changed the price. This is the nature of an unregulated situation. You need somebody watching the store to make sure the game is being played fairly. And individuals, unfortunately, um, Yaron, unfortunately, not only, as the cops say, does speed kill, greed kills. Greed kills the economy, it kills growth, and it kills uh, the middle class. So counting on this sort of halcyon picture that you've just painted isn't the way our economy and our society is working, in fact.
So, of course it's not working. I mean, I'm glad you chose the examples that you chose because you've just chosen the most regulated business in the United States where all this happened. There is no, reg there's no business, no business more regulated than banking. If you want to start a bank, you need to get regulatory approval for your business plan, your choice of CEO, CFO, board of directors, investors who invests in you. If you're a bank pre-2008, you had five regulatory agencies looking at every piece of paper you produced. At JP Morgan today, as we speak, 129 regulators go to work at JP Morgan. That's their full-time job, is to regulate JP Morgan. They have offices in their corporate headquarters. Uh, other investment banks are exactly the same. Washington Mutual is probably one of the most regulated businesses ever. It basically was an SNL. Uh, SNLs were, the, the bank was restricted in what it could do, how it could do it, when it could do it. Uh, you know, it always surprises me. Why does all the fraud always come to particular industries? And, and, and it's because it always comes to those industries that government controls, creates perverse incentives, and all the bad guys show up to take advantage of the perverse incentives. But the perverse incentives are not created by a marketplace. This financial crisis could not have happened in a marketplace. Uh, the SNL crisis could have never happened in a marketplace. The only thing that creates these crises are the distortions that government regulations create. Let's take examples. Investment banking. <laughs> Investment banking. Well, why did the CEOs make all these profits and not care about the dying side? Well, because they knew the Fed would bail them out. It's too big to fail. Don't worry, be happy. Take on risk as much as you want. Basically, the Fed, Greenspan put, they called it, has basically told the investment banks for, for two decades now, take on all the risk you want, we'll bail you out, don't worry, be happy. Yeah, they took the risks and they took the rewards, but these are rewards that were created by government bureaucrats, by cronyism, not by markets. Uh, five major banks, I mean the settlements, oh my God. Um, you know, this is extortion. This is, this is what Giuliani perfected. Uh, Spitzer uh, uh, became a master of this, and, and the current uh, uh, Justice Department is capitalizing on that. You go to these banks, you threaten them with criminal prosecution, you threaten them with things, you know, reams and reams. This will, it it, it takes decades to litigate. It'll cost billions of dollars to litigate. It's much simpler for these banks to write a check and to make it go away. It's better for their shareholders. The uncertainty is resolved. But the fact that a, bank, that a bank settles does not mean anything. We live in such a horrific judiciary environment today that businessmen constantly, constantly settle even when they know they're innocent because it is nuts to take these kind of things to courts given awards, given juries, and given the, 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 the biases that exist in our society. You know, I could get into, if somebody wants to ask about LIBOR, I mean, LIBOR is such a, uh, uh, you know, the way they calculated LIBOR to begin with, it's the London Interbank Borrowing Rate, and, and it basically, they would call the bankers up and say, uh, what do you think, what do you think, if your bank had to lend money to another bank, what would be the interest rate? This was not a market-derived interest rate, this was based on opinion. Now, during the financial crisis, the early days of financial crisis, because our mortgages were linked to LIBOR, there was enormous political pressure for the banks to keep those rates as low as possible. So when, when they were made that call, what do you think you, you know, the borrowing rate would be to another bank? If the bankers had told the truth, which was that interest rates were very high because all the bankers were afraid to lend and borrow to each other because of the uncertainty, LIBOR would have skyrocketed, your mortgage rates would have gone through the roof, and the political pressure on them was incredible to keep those rates low. So guess what? They lied, which is bankers do when, when politicians tell them. You know, and we could go on and on with these things. Um, you know, stock options. Stock options are one of, in my view, one of the greatest creations that, that American capitalism has created. They are terrific instruments that tie the performance of CEOs to shareholders, to firm performance. And they resulted in, in the fact that if you look at CEO pay and its relationship to performance, uh, during the period of stock options, there was a very, very, very close relationship between the two. If you look at empirical evidence, after empirical evidence, in the finance literature, in the 40s, 50s, and 60s, there was very little relationship between stock market performance and CEO pay. 
In the 80s and 90s, there was a very strong relationship between CEO pay and market performance. That's why shareholders kept voting these stock options in, because it was good for the shareholders. Um, CEO pay generally, this is, you know, CEO pay generally uh, divided by market value. If you take CEO pay divided by the market value of the companies they run, was higher in the 40s and 50s than it is today. The reason CEOs make so much money today because they run companies that are so much more valuable. And they run companies that are so much more valuable because they've been so good at it. They've been so good at it in terms of creating value. If you look at American, I'll end with this. If you look at American business, I mean, this was kind of uh, brushed over. But remember what the 1970s were like. Stagflation. Uh, the, the American economy was going to tailspin. Uh, American business was losing market share massively to foreigners. We were, we, were, we, were we were inefficient, unproductive. American businesses were worth very little. They were conglomerate. They were inefficient. CEOs didn't make maybe a lot of money cash-wise, but they enjoyed running a big conglomerate and going to the nice parties. What happened with stock options was you got a restructuring of American business, the wonder of the hostile takeovers in the 1980s. I know you think this is horrible, but the, 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 the so-called junk bonds of the 1980s, that was the restructuring of American business. And what happened is when we went from an inefficient conglomerate structure in the 70s to, to the most efficient companies in the world during the 1990s. And that happened because of things like stock options and financial innovations that produced some of the best companies in the world in this country. Thank you. Okay. Uh, we're gonna, we can have a little bit more back and okay. forth, and well, then we're going to go to questions. I, I really want to talk about deregulation, but just on stock options for a moment. The idea, actually, uh, of pay performance, which is what stock options is, was, was actually first articulated by Michael Jensen, an associate professor of Harvard Business School. About 15 years later, Jensen looked at the market and said it had been so badly manipulated by corporate leaders in which corporate performance actually went down in lots of cases instead of up, but they still uh, picked up lots of stock options is that Jensen himself called it managerial heroin. In other words, managers were addicted to it and it wasn't generating uh, what Yaron just said. But let's talk about this idea of the financial markets being the most regulated of all. If you go back to 1980, the first thing that got deregulated was the interest rate on first mortgages. Up until that time, there, had, there were uh, state usury laws that put a limit on what banks could charge on first mortgages. In 1980, the Congress passed a law that deregulated that. So we're moving in the direction that, Mar that, that Yaron says we should move in, towards deregulation, let the businesses do what they want. In 1982, con under Reagan, Congress passed a couple more laws. There used to be a regulation and a law that said homeowners had to put down 20% down payment when they uh, bought a home. Uh, a law was passed that year which allowed 100% financing of homes, which led to a lot of the risky subprime loans that wound up by blowing up on our faces. Now, the argument was that the self-interest of the bankers would protect them from making loans that were unwise and would cause the banks trouble and would cause the financial system trouble. The second thing that was passed in 1982 was a regulation that permitted negative amortization, which means that your debt can actually grow while you're paying your mortgage off. And how you do that is the same way as if you make a minimum payment on your credit card. You pay neither the principal nor the interest, but part of it. And people didn't get that. Uh, there was also a, a regulation passed that allowed adjustable rate mortgages. This was going to be a freer market. Now, this is the market that Aaron says has been increasingly regulated. I'm sorry. All these steps are deregulatory steps being taken across the board uh, for those banks. In 1984, Congress passed a law which set up the secondary mortgage market, which allowed the mortgage banks that originated the mortgages who used to hang on to the mortgages and make their money through the interest payments that people made on their mortgages to sell them off and incentivize them to charge high fees at the initiation and the origination of the mortgages and sell off the risk to somebody in Wall Street. Wall Street got a hold of those mortgages, began packaging them, securitizing them, chopping them up in various different packages, and selling them to investors around the world. Then we had a regulator in name only who happened to be a follower of the same philosophy of Yaron Brook, uh, <laughs> Alan Greenspan, and he believed in the market. He said, free the market, don't regulate. There may be 129 guys in there, but don't have them do anything. 
And one of his fellow Federal Reserve board members said in 2004, you know, the subprime market is getting out of control. There are a whole lot of 100% mortgages being issued to people who can't pay them back. It's going to blow up on our faces and disturb the financial system. Maybe we should regulate that. Greenspan said, no, the banks are not going to do anything against their self-interest. We can trust the free market. In 1998, Brooksley Bourne, who was chair of the Commodity Futures Trading Commission, said, we better look out for the derivatives market. Tens of trillions of dollars are being built on these collateralized debt obligations, which is what these pools of mortgages were, uh, were called. And we're building a castle in the sky. It's a house of cards. We need to regulate it. Not only did Alan Greenspan say no, but Robert Rubin, the former chair, co-chair of Goldman Sachs from Wall Street, said no, Wall Street will take care of itself. Greenspan said no, this will all work out fine. Trust the banks. Kaboom. 2000. This is not a highly regulated market. This is n the details may have been regulated down in the interstices, but the basic strategies were not being regulated at all. The bond rating agencies were not being regulated. They were blessing all these these securities that were being sold to investors without actually investigating them. There was not a good job being done at all. And after the market exploded in 2008, our friend Mr. Greenspan was called up to Congress after he'd left the Federal Reserve and was asked to talk about what had happened. And in one of those rare public comments, Greenspan, putting it rather gingerly, said, I was shocked to find a flaw in my thinking. And what he meant and said was, my thinking about the free market working fine on its own and you can trust the banks to look out for their own self-interest. And he said, and these are his words, that cast doubt on his deregulatory policies. Now, this is a man who was in office for 20 years, and that's what he has to say about what Yaron Brook is advocating right now. Uh, I knew Alan Greenspan would come to bite me. Um, <laughs> back to Greenspan has now been a follower of, of my ideology for a long time, at least since the uh, mid-1980s when he headed the Ronald Reagan Social Security Commission. And by the fact that he took the job at the Federal Reserve suggests a betrayal of these ideas. But, um, you know, we could go on all night. <laughs> yeah, I don't believe there should be a Federal Reserve. So. Um, and, and neither did Alan Greenspan in, in the 1960s. He wrote essays about it, so um, about the fact that they shouldn't be a Fed. Uh, but uh, let's take, I, I, I'm just going to take two examples because we could do this all night. Um, rating agencies, I love the rating agency story because it's a, it's, a, it's, it's a fantastic story. So the rating agencies, Moody's, Fitch, and S&P, there are three of them. Um, in, 19, in 1994, Orange County, the county that I live in in California, went bankrupt uh, a month before the bankruptcy or three weeks before the bankruptcy. All three agencies had them uh, rated a triple A. Remember Enron uh, went bankrupt in 2001, I think? Um, a, a week before Enron went bankrupt, all three agencies had them rated a AAA. Now, when you perform that poorly in a market economy, what happens to you? You lose market share, you go out of business, you get destroyed. Three rating agencies just grew and grew and grew to the, to the point where they were powerful. By the way, they're still growing. Why is that? And, and as an economist, you have to go and say, what's going on here? This is a market failure? How can these guys, how can this happen? Well, it turns out, not surprisingly, that there are only three rating agencies, because there are only three rating agencies allowed. The SEC allows three rating agencies, only those three. Nobody can compete with them. Nobody can compete with them. You need SEC approval to rate. Oh, but you say, if you're a good economist, you say, but wait a minute, but if they're bad, why does anybody use them? Aha, ERISA, a law passed in the early 1970s, another one of Nixon's uh, wonderful laws, that says that pension plans and insurance companies, when they invest, have to invest in securities that are rated. By whom? By the three rating agencies that the SEC approves. So this is a government monopoly created by government, held together by government because they have a built-in audience because of ERISA. They'll never lose their customers. And they just, yeah, they screw up over and over and over again. The market never punishes them because there is no market. And this is truth throughout this crisis. Every time you peel another layer, there is a government control, there is a government regulation, there is a government entity that created the incentives to create the problem. 
I, I found it surprising uh, that you mentioned that the 1980s uh, created the secondary market in mortgages, it, it, because that's, that's just not true. Uh, the Freddie, uh, Fannie Mae was created in the late 1930s and, and flourished through the 40s and 50s and 60s, and its whole job was to create a secondary market in mortgages. That was the purpose of its creation, to buy the mortgages from banks, you know, to encourage banks to give out more mortgages. This is housing policy, government housing policy. This is not a free market. Government housing policy. In the 1960s, they added uh, Freddie Mac to Fannie Mae, another government entity, to do the same thing. And they increased their mandate. They, they demanded that they do more of this, that they buy up more of these mortgages. And indeed, you can pinpoint the point in which bankers could not be relied upon anymore to do. Because when did this crazy mortgages come about? You didn't have these mortgages in the 90s, even though these laws were passed in the 80s. You suddenly got them in 2000s. And what happened was that the Clinton administration told Freddie and Fannie, you guys have to start getting much more involved in subprime lending. And the Bush administration reinforced that. You guys need to get to the point where you're, in a sense, buying up 50% of all these subprime loans. And the Freddie and Fannie basically went to the bank. And, and people forget that in the early 2000s, Freddie and Fannie's books were such disaster that, that they had to stop reporting their quarterly earnings. They didn't report financial statements. They had to be audited. There was massive fraud there, which nobody's gone to jail for, but the government entity, so who, who would go? Um, and and the, the Freddie and Fannie went to the banks and said, We'll buy anything you guys produce. Don't worry, uh, uh, Washington Mutual. Don't worry about paperwork. Don't worry. We'll buy it all. We'll securitize it because we have a government mandate that we have to fulfill and we have to live up to. Um, talk about pay, the people who ran Freddie and Fannie, the amount of pay they made. Uh, and, and they were run uh, like government entities. So that they raised money at the risk-free rate because everybody assumed that they would be bailed out by the government, so the, the bonds of Freddie and Fannie were like government bonds. And indeed, of course, they were. They were bailed out by the government, and they are today in receivership uh, run by the government. Today, by the way, they buy 95% of all the mortgages in the United States. If you think there's a healthy housing market out there, that healthy housing market is because basically government-guaranteed institution is buying up 95% of all the mortgages. Uh, what we have today is one of the most perverse economic structures we've ever seen in the West. I know that our audience, <laughs> thank you. I know, I know that all of you have questions this evening, so we're going to open up the mic for audience questions and participation. Please go ahead. Okay. Um, Mr. Smith, uh, Instead of talking about these specific instances of what you claim are market failure and what uh, Dr. Brooks says is government failure, I'd like you to address the one sort of fundamental moral point that Dr. Brooks made in his presentation, um, one, of the, one of the fundamental moral points, which was the notion of inequality being a good sign about the freedom in a society. It, do, you, do you not accept that? And if you don't, what, what is the right measure? What is the right ratio of CEO pay to average worker pay that would be a valid sign of equality? Thank well, I, I think that we as a society in America probably accept economic inequality uh, more than almost any other society in the world. And I would certainly say that, that Yaron is right, and I share the idea that people who work hard, people who invent things, people who, who, uh, who organize and run business as well, and so forth, deserve a higher pay than people who do routine work. Uh, but I think there is a sense at which it's kind of like obscenity, you know? Um, you may not be able to define it, but you sure can recognize it when you see it. We're at that point in the American economy today. It's not a mathematical formula. What we have is an inequality in America today that is not only unfair to the middle class, but destructive to economic growth. There are all kinds of economic studies out uh, of the American economy and periods in the American economy, of international economies, other foreign economies, which show that you have a slower growth rate when you have high inequality of incomes and wealth, and that you actually have a faster growth for the economy as a whole. 
So it's not when you have the great convergence that I was talking about before. There's a historical record there we can see, but there are economic studies that have done it. So what we're finding, I don't think this is a moral question. I think actually it's one of the things that interests me about the difference I have with Yaron. He wants to make every issue a moral issue, and I don't see them as moral issues. I see them as practical issues. Uh, and this is practically, it, it, it doesn't make sense to have the kind of inequality we have. Uh, it's detri you know, we have an economy that at the moment is failing at least 22 million Americans. I think if you want to talk about morality, I think that's immoral. Uh, we have 22 million Americans today who want full-time work and can't get it. They, have full, they want full-time work. You know, about half of them have no jobs. About half of them, eight or nine million, have part-time work and they want full-time work. And another four or five million have dropped out of the labor market uh, because they found it futile. In fact, we have a lower labor market participation than we had before. It seems to me that, that and you talked about an ethical society earlier, Yaron, I think an ethical society, a fair society, is trying to generate a, a decent living for all of the people who live in the society, and certainly a decent living for the majority of people who live in that society. It, 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 what Jeremy Bentham called the greatest good for the greatest number uh, in the 19th century. And I think we ha what we have now has failed, but we regard it as successful because when we look at growth, we see the growth figures going up. When we look at corporate profits, over the last four years, corporate profits have risen 20.1% per year for the last four years while median household income has risen 1.4%. So the people at the top are profiting enormously. We have large corporations that have essentially detached themselves from the American economy. That's one of the reasons why we're having trouble finding jobs for Americans to make it work. And when you don't have jobs for Americans and, and they can't uh, uh, meet their needs, it isn't just a matter of meeting their own needs. You can't fund school bond issues. You can't fund road funding issues in counties in Ohio and Indiana and Illinois and Wisconsin. So I think the answer to your question is, is not a moral one, it's a practical one. Can I? You can respond, and then we'll go to the so, next question. So, you know, it is a moral issue. Uh, it's immoral to steal. It's immoral to take things from people. It's immoral to coerce people to do things they don't want. And it's a practical problem, because the fact is I believe that morality is practical, and what's practical turns out to be moral. It is a practical issue. Yes, 22 million Americans can't find a job. Why? Because a government regulations and because of government redistribution of wealth. The idea of the correlation between inequality and, and, uh, and, and economic activity is absurd. Uh, there is no relationship between the two. Economic growth is associated with economic freedom. It is not associated with any particular rate of inequality. And indeed the inequality numbers that you've heard are not true. Uh, there's a recent Cornell paper that has looked at the original numbers and, and has, has, has looked at them properly, has taken out the biases, has corrected for things like the changes in households and what constitutes a household, and shows that the middle class, you know, I'm not, I'm not saying this is good. Middle class incomes have grown since 1978 by 20%. That's not good enough. It should be much greater. And yes, the top 1% has grown much more than that, but why? because they've managed to leverage their skill and their ability because of technology, because of globalization, to a greater extent, good for them. We're all benefiting from that fact. We're all much better for that fact. So if you want, if you want practicality, we can create 22 million jobs tomorrow. Tomorrow, this is easy stuff. All we have to do is do away with Obamacare, Dodd-Frank, Sarbanes-Oxley, if you massively deregulate the economy as we did, don't forget that the late 1970s saw massive unemployment in the United States, the highest unemployment since the Great Depression. How did we get rid of that unemployment? By all that evil deregulation that, that, uh, that uh, Carter, Jimmy Carter started it, actually Ford started it, Jimmy Carter started it, and, and, that, and that Reagan got involved in. That's what created the jobs, the tax decreases, and the, inc then the decreases in regulation. So it, we know how to create jobs. Free up the economy, reduce regulations, and get the Fed to stop manipulating uh, uh, the money supply, to stop manipulating interest rates, to stop preventing banks from lending money. The biggest problem we have today is that economically, 
is that banks are not lending money because A, they're not allowed to, and B, they're incentivized not to because the Fed is paying them an interest on the reserves that they hold at the Fed. So the Fed is printing money and then storing it at the Fed so nobody can use it. It's the most bizarre economic policy that anybody has ever invented. And it's, it's true, Bernanke is running an ex unprecedented experiment that is bound to lead to disaster. Almost nobody thinks this can be successful in the end. Now, I want to say that I, I want to say for the... I want to say for the first time tonight, I really agree with Yaron. The Fed is running a totally bizarre policy. It is loaning money to the banks at virtually zero percent and then letting the banks loan money back to the federal government at two or three no, percent. No, so, yeah. But I mean, it's utterly ridiculous. All right. Now, let, let's get it. The, the, pro the, pro the problem, the problem is questions. not the problem is not government regulation holding back. Of course back. it is. Of course. Excuse me. You had your shot. All right. Well, uh, you want to go to the next question. Yeah, well, capital, <laughs> major corporations are sitting on $2 trillion of capital. They can invest it in companies. They're not investing and because not, of the regulations. No, it's all not right. the regulations at all. The they, moderator no demand. intercedes. Next question. A couple things about your book, Mr. Smith. I noticed that your book is filled with attacks on rightists, right-wingers, hardcore right-wingers, hard writers, hard members of the right, but there's no... No, there are no references to leftists or, that is to say, hard leftists or left-wingers in your book. I guess they don't exist from your standpoint. Also, okay? there's that sleazy, slimy reference to the Tea Party's racist motivation. Shame on you for that. I'd like to ask you... Okay, we're going to keep it... This question, don't, don't uh, use given this your desire to yeah. manipulate... Anybody. We're going to keep this civil. I, I think I'm going to pass on your question. Thank you. Okay. You don't want to ask, answer Next my question? question. Thanks. May I ask a question, Professor? Professor, may I ask a question, Professor Cobb? No. What? Next question. Thank you. Hi. Uh, this mes uh, question is for uh, Dr. Brooke. Um, Dr. Brooke, when when Ayn Rand was alive, she spoke out uh, against uh, communism and other collectivist um, ideologies. Um, if she were alive today, in your opinion, um, would she, what would she be speaking out against um, as far as the philosophy uh, permeating through our society? And I'd just like to throw out a suggestion of uh, this kind of utopian egalitarianism that that might be out there. But I just want to know, um, you know, what, what what should what would she be speaking out against the the philosophy that's driving society today? Well, I mean, it's an unfair question because I don't know what she'd be speaking out against. She was a, I think she was a genius. I'm not, um, and I don't try to predict what she would be. But it, but in terms of the f major philosophical threats to America today, I think they're fundamentally two: one from the left and one from the right. Uh, from the left, it's Rawlsian egalitarianism. Yes, it's John Rawls from here of Harvard, I think, is a major threat and probably the most influential political theorist uh, and, and, and philosopher of, of the, unfortunately, of the 20th century. He's had a profound impact on the way people think about the world and is a real threat to freedom and to, and to, and to individual liberty uh, in the world today. And I think many of the policies, many of the, the, the horrific policies of both Republicans and Democrats over the last... Uh, you know, over the last 20 years have been influenced by, uh, by Wall's ideas. Uh, the whole debate about inequality, this debate wouldn't have happened if not, f if, I think, if not for Wall's. On the right, I think she would have been decrying the, the, uh, the rise of a religiosity that is, uh, that is intolerant, uh, that is uh, militant, and that is uh, oppressive. And I think she would be condemning those two as the major threats uh, to American liberty both an individual level and as a, as a society. Would you like to respond? Thank you. Next thing. Thank you. Freedom is a great thing. Uh, shouldn't it be the role of government to ensure that uh, people are free from want, free from deprivation, free from freezing? Shouldn't it be the role of government to ensure that uh, people are free from breathing contaminated air and drinking contaminated water and that other species are free from extinction and harm and cruelty? There are many dimensions to freedom out there other than simply an abstraction uh, for corporations and other rich individuals to do as they please. Assume that's to me. Whoever wants to answer. To both. Uh, my answer is no. I mean, no, it's not the government's job to take care of endangered species. It's not the government's job 
to protect us from freedom from want. It's not the government's job to protect us from freedom for anything. Indeed, the fact that the government is doing that is a direct repudiation of the founding principles of this country. Uh, your right to life is a right to, you, to live your life as you see fit. Not as a government sees fit, not as your neighbor sees fit, not as anybody else sees fit, but as you see fit. And you could fail at that life, and it's not the government's job, your failure. Uh, all rights mean is a protection of your life from the use of force by your neighbor. That's all rights mean. When you talk about freedom from want, what does that mean? That means the fact that you want something means that you have a right to take it from me. I say no, you don't have that right. You know, we understand this in interpersonal relationships. The fact that you have a desire for an iPhone doesn't mean that you have a right to steal mine. But somehow we think that if we all vote for it, it's okay for all of us to vote to take my money and give it to you so you can buy an iPhone. That, that, there, there is no, there is no, there is no difference between stealing as an interpersonal thing or stealing through democracy. It is still stealing. And we understand this, by the way, uh, about freedom of speech. We don't say, you know, 51% of us don't like what your aunt says, so we're going to vote him silenced. In speech, we understand that that's an absolute right, that I can speak whatever. But my property, that's not an absolute right. You, you feel completely free to get together with your neighbors and vote me, my property, away from me and take it away from you to, to fulfill your wants or your whatever desires you happen to have. That, to me, is theft, and that, to me, is coercion, and that, to me, is the opposite of what government is supposed to do. You don't have a freedom to take my stuff. You don't have a right to my things. Okay, a theory of government. Mr. Smith, we're gonna let, we're gonna let Mr. Smith, thank you. We're gonna let Mr. Smith respond. Okay. I, I just like to go to something fairly basic, Yaron. You, you talk about individuals as though they're, they're free atoms floating around in the sky without ever colliding with each other, and so we can all exercise our freedom without ever having any impact on each other. When this audience arrived here tonight and when it leaves here tonight, most people are going to get in cars. They're going to drive down the street on the right-hand side of the road. They're going to stop at traffic lights. They're going to observe red lights. They're either going to turn right or not turn right if there's an arrow or whether or not it's permitted. When they get further out, they're going to obey speed limits of one kind or another. Uh, and, the, and, and then we go on and we have a whole bunch of rules that say you can't drink when you're driving. You can't use uh, drugs when you're driving. You can't speed. You can't switch lanes. Now, this is impinging on your right and your freedom, okay, in a very basic sense. I mean, if you wanted to drive any way you wanted to, if you wanted to live any way you wanted to, if you could drive economically anywhere you wanted to, you can't. Because when you do that, you start to impinge on the freedom of other people to be able to do that. We live in a community. We're not atomized individuals. And you're articulating again and again a philosophy that feels like it comes from 18th century rural America, where there was plenty of room for anybody to live any way they wanted to. We don't live in that kind of society today. We live in an enormously compact and complex society. When the freedom of of the CEO of a major company who wants to pursue that policy and the people who get together at the business roundtable begin to impact the way the, the whole economy operates. And the 22 million people who don't have jobs today that they want don't have the freedom to get them. If one or two of them or two or 3,000 of them get them, they will knock other people out of the jobs. The system, the environment, does not provide them the freedom to do what you say everybody ought to want to do. So we live in a society in which we have already, in lots of major ways and lots of minor ways, accepted limitations on ourselves simply to be able to live together. There are enormous benefits for us to live in concentrated societies. You can have companies that mass produce cell phones or cars or insurance or even get a number of people to a crazy debate like this one tonight. Um, you know, and, and we, I think, I think when, I, when I hear you, the a priori assumptions that lie behind the philosophy you're articulating assume a reality which simply doesn't correspond to the reality that we live in today. 
and therefore I, there, there are all kinds of regulations and sacrifices and give and take that are involved in a community. And you make it all sound like it's dictatorship. It's not. I've lived in a dictatorship. And you've come close to living in a dictatorship. Um, I, I know what that feels like. This is very different. This is negotiated. And yes, there is a power struggle. There's a back and forth. There's a pulling and toing and froing. But, you know, if you go back and look at the founding fathers, you know, Washington, Jefferson, Hamilton, they believed in government subsidies to build the Erie Canal. Washington talks about the need for domestic manufactories for the United States to be able to stand up to the British. Uh, the government was involved in these things right with the founders. It's not as if they had this genius idea of it's free individuals and we don't get involved at all. I, I mean, I, I, it feels to me as though that you, what you're talking about is mythical. It's nice, but it's mythical. It's desirable, sounds great, but it's mythical. It's not the real world we live in. Quick response so, and then next nothing week. about this is atomistic. I believe in, in complex societies. I just believe that complexity should not, is too important to be left to the government. Uh, I believe in individuals pursuing their own self-interest through trade and not through coercion. And it is coercive. It's not... Soviet Union, granted, it's not even the socialism of Israel. But the fact is that people are taking my money, every paycheck, to buy themselves air conditioning or to buy themselves whatever, and they have no right to it. It's still theft. And there's nothing in my system that prevents the complexity and the roads and the system. All, you, all the rule is you can't put, place other people at physical risk. You can't commit fraud. You can't commit crimes, crimes in terms of physical force. People get along great under those circumstances, and I'm glad you find it at least appealing theoretically. That's, that's good. Boy, that, that, that was really not a nice cut. <laughs> Next question. So I would like if you guys could talk about um, your ideas on class mobility a little more. I had uh, economist Steve Horowitz come to Suffolk, and he discussed how if you take, for example, you know, women's wages, you're saying there's a 40% gap. You factor out choices like they're more likely to have part-time. They're more likely to go into social um, de degrees and get that type of work. Then the wage gap actually goes down at about 2%. And it's been decreasing over the years. And so I'm just thinking that when we have choices, yes, we might have different results, but that's good that we have those choices. And so I just wonder what your opinion is. I have to tell you, I didn't quite get the point of your question. For, forgive me. I'm not. I, I was just wanted to talk about class mobility. Do you think that we have in America? And if it's a result Excellent. of choices. Excellent question. Very important question. You know, I think one of the things that made me the proudest uh, of America as I was growing up was that we were the land of opportunity, that the opportunity for people to rise from the bottom to the top, the Horatio Alger story, was an American story that we read about in our history, and uh, it, it, was, it was inspiring. And the ability of people to move from the bottom to the middle and then from the middle to the top was important. What sadly has happened over the last three or four decades is that we've lost the title of land of opportunity. We are no longer the country, the advanced economy, in which it is the easiest to move from the bottom to the top or the middle to the top or the bottom to the middle. Uh, there are all kinds of studies out that show that if you live in Germany or you live in France or you live in uh, Denmark or Sweden or Finland or Norway or Canada or Australia, that it is easier to move from the bottom up to the middle and from the middle up to the top. Now, I think that's, going back to Yaron's basic values, the opportunity of the individual to live to their fullest potential is terribly important. I agree with that, absolutely. Um, and there are all kinds of built-in disadvantages, and there are all kinds of built-in advantages. The kids who were born to wealthy parents get all kinds of after-school training, all kinds of additional education outside of the classroom that's not available to a lot of middle-class kids and certainly not to poor kids. Uh, there are studies out that show that we probably have 30,000 of the most talented high school graduates in the country who are not going to college because they have no idea that there's any path for them to get there. The market doesn't make it available. First of all, the market doesn't inform them. 
that it's within their potential. And secondly, the market doesn't make it available. This notion that the market somehow perfectly produces solutions for everybody, or options, not even solutions, options for everybody, is a myth. It's simply not reality in America today. And I wish we could get back to the land of opportunity that we once were. So we are going to agree uh, on, on the importance of, of, of mobility, of the ability of people to rise up and to change. And the fact is, I mean, look, there's studies all over the map about this, about how far America sunk and how relative it is to other countries. There's, there's, it's not as clear cut uh, as that. But there's no question, mobility across uh, wealth uh, standards has declined in America has declined dramatically in America. And, and there's no question in my mind the reason for that is a lack of economic freedom. Over-regulation, over-taxation, over-government control. You can see economic study after economic study that show the correlation between economic freedom and mobility. You know when the greatest mobility in human history was? The greatest wealth mobility in human history was during the 19th century in America, when there were very few regulations, very few taxes, very few controls. And it was a regular phenomenon from short sleeves to short sleeve, right? In, in two generations, people would make huge amounts of wealth, lose huge amounts of wealth. Most of the so-called robber barons, they're very much so-called, um, started out with nothing. They were dirt poor, whether it's Rockefeller, Carnegie, they were dirt poor, and yet they succeeded. And, and there's evidence to suggest that that still happens in America. If you look at the, if you look at the Forbes 400, more or fewer of the Forbes 400 today uh, inherited their wealth than 20 or 30 years ago. Most of the wealth, the real big wealth, the 0.001%, uh, is made, is created entrepreneurially. It's not inherited. Uh, most of the kids who do that come from middle class families, not from wealthy families. Uh, and some still come from very poor families. So yes, we need, we need a mobility. What we need to have mobility is economic freedom. We need capitalism. Capitalism creates in every time that it's tried free markets create, in capitalism I mean unregulated markets, free of government force. Those markets create many, many more jobs than, are, than they are people. Every experiment in history shows this. This is why America saw such, saw such mass immigration into America during the 19th century, because we created so many jobs. Look at Hong Kong, fishing village to seven and a half million people because they have a free economy that generates huge quantities of jobs and people keep coming in. Even America today, even America today, if you opened up the borders, people would come in and find jobs. It's sad that Americans won't do the job, those jobs themselves. It's sad that some of those 22 million people won't go and pick apples in Oregon and the apples rot on the trees because nobody will pick them. So there's also the fact that our social programs today pay people so much that in certain states, it's a lot more than the minimum wage, so why go get a job? Okay. This is, we have time for one last question and then we're gonna to go to closing remarks, so you're on. Okay, so this is for Yaren. It's a multi-parter. So one thing that I would like to hear more about is one of the biggest issues I see, which is government power over our money. Over so for you, over our money. So what is the proper funding of a legitimate government in a rights-protecting society? In other words, how would a valid government and all those operations be funded? Can you talk about the benefits of that system and what a transition would look like? What would be the challenges and solutions? In 20 seconds. Huh. <laughs> <laughs> so look, I believe in a government that is about 80% to 90% smaller than the government that we have today. Uh, during the 19th century, the U.S. government spent uh, somewhere between three to four, put, put aside wars, three to four percent of GDP. We're spending right now 22 percent of GDP, and that's just at the federal level. If you count state and local government, the United States today is spending about 42 percent of GDP. Government entities are spending about 42 percent of GDP. Sweden, that everybody calls the model of socialism, spends like two or three points more of GDP uh, in terms of government expenditure. So we're Sweden. We're not that different from Sweden anymore in terms of the, the size of government. Uh, so if you shrink it by 90%, if you shrink it back to 3 4 5% of GDP, it's going to be easy to fund. I mean, you can think of multiple different ways to fund it. Uh, but look, the, the interesting question is how do we get there? 
not what happens when we get there. What happens when we get there is going to be easy to solve because it's going to be such a wealthy society and such a small government that it will be easy to, to fund. And how we get there is, is you need principles. You need a moral vision. You need a moral vision for what you're fighting for. You need to start unwinding the state. The, the state, you know, it started with the, the ruling classes that control it, including, it, it, to me, the number one issue is cronyism. The number one issue that can be dealt with quickly and easy. Now, this is my, my only political suggestion tonight. This is my suggestion to the Republican Party, or the Democrats, Democrats can pick this up as well, as, as the number one plaque that they should do, and of course, neither party will do this. They should commit, and, and actually execute on this, on driving all subsidies to business to zero within the first 100 days of the new administration. Zero. No subsidies to oil companies. That'll satisfy the left. No subsidies to Solyndra. No subsidies to banks. Zero subsidies. Now, I would also encourage them then to massively deregulate, but zero subsidies. Let's see them just do that. Get government, get business out of the business of government and a government out of the business of business. So step one, stop subsidies. Step two, start deregulating. That should be simple, right? It's impossible. Republicans just passed a $300 billion farm bill. Every Republican voted for this that basically gives $300 billion of subsidies manipulating the markets in farming. And we know how well that works. It's, it's, it's already a disaster. And it's, it's always been a disaster. So Look, getting there is about shrinking the government, and to shrink the government, what you need is to change the moral code that people believe in. As long as people believe that, you know, it is the job of the government to provide for people's wants, as long as people believe that they are their brother's keeper, and that is their main moral responsibility is to take care of their brother, we will have big government. We need a morality of individualism, and government will shrink as a consequence. Oh, are we going to conclude? You want to, you're you're welcome right to now? respond, and then we can conclude. <laughs> uh, just go ahead. Okay. <laughs> All right. Then we have our our closing remarks now, uh, and and I'm I'm happy to let either of you go first, Mr. Brooklyn. Sure. <laughs> I felt like I just gave them. Uh, so did I. <laughs> so did I. It was a nice setup question. <laughs> Having been in a number of political events, I sort of recognize the set-up question. <laughs> Would you I tell us what your philosophy is, Mr. I Mr. Book? Could you tell us what your <laughs> philosophy is? Thank you very much. Uh, I mean, so let me let me feed off of that question. Yeah, I mean, I th I think that uh, you know my political philosophy is ultimately derived from my my belief in morality and in my moral philosophy. Uh, my moral philosophy is a philosophy of individualism. It is my view that individual's moral purpose in life is the achievement of his own life, the achievement of the best life that he can achieve for himself. That means being rational. That means thinking long term. That means being honest and having integrity and dealing with other people as if their life was an end in itself, not just your life was an end in itself. Uh, it means not sacrificing to other people but not expecting other people to sacrifice to you. It means living an independent, rational, long-term existence for yourself, for your own happiness. And that involves intense social relationships because one of the most self-interested things in the world is love, friendship. You get enormous spiritual values for those. And of course, in economics, I believe that the main way in which we deal with each other is the same way as in ethics, through trade through value for value propositions. That's what we do and should do in all our human relationships. We don't expect, shouldn't expect people to sacrifice for us in, uh, in, in our personal lives. We shouldn't expect people to sacrifice for us in economic lives, and we shouldn't expect people to sacrifice for us in our political lives. Politics should be limited to questions regarding Coercion, because again, government is force. That, that's what it is. No matter how you slice it, when you vote, you're voting about how is government going to use its gun and on whom. I want government to use its gun only on the bad guys. And here I define bad guys as criminals who are violating other people's rights, i.e. using force, using force or fraud, 
to violate other people's you know, individual life. And as long as people don't do that, and as long as people are not engaged in fraudulent or forceful activities, government should leave them alone. Now, all I'm asking, really, is in a, for a society in which government leaves us alone. You can do whatever you want as a, as a group. You can get together and start a commune. I don't think, believe a government should, have, should be capitalist or socialist or anything. I just think government should be there to protect us and let us live our lives. You want to go found a kibbutz? Horrible idea. They're awful. I've, I've, I've been on them. <laughs> Disasters. But if you want to go found one and you can find other people who voluntarily go with you, go do it. You want to go do, do, try other, some other kind of social experiment? Go do it. I just want to be left free to pursue my life. I want you to be left free to pursue your life. Our values might be the same. Our values might be different. As long as they don't clash, as long as I don't stick my hand into your pocket and take your stuff, or as long as you don't, you don't try to defraud me, government has no role in the relationship between you and me. And if that relationship is commercial, doesn't matter. It doesn't have a, any business in our love relationship, in our friendship. You know, tell that to conservatives, right? But it shouldn't have any relationship with, it, with, our, with, our, with our relationship, with our friendship, and it shouldn't have any relationship with our commercial relationships. It should leave us alone. That's what freedom means. Freedom means being left alone, free of what? Free of coercion. And in the modern setting, the primary coercer is government. So. What you want is a moral code of individualism, and the only political system that respects that moral code is a system of capitalism, a system of free markets, uh, a system of limited government. Well, what I would say is that over the last 30 or 40 years, the basic trend has been in the direction from the New Deal in the direction that Aaron Brook would like us to go. The basic direction of policy, public policy, has been articulated by people like Alan Greenspan and Bob Rubin and others towards laissez-faire economics, towards trusting the market. Market values, market success, the market test has become the far more prevalent yardstick used in most Washington policy discussions during my years down there as a reporter. So I, I see a different world and a different trend, obviously, uh, than Yaron Brooks sees in terms of what's happened. And what disturbs me about that is the very morality that Yaron Brook would like to see guiding human behavior is going in the wrong direction. I believe that American capitalism today is more immoral than it was 30 or 40 years ago, partly because wealth is less shared, certainly because business leaders see much less of a connection and an obligation and a responsibility, first of all to their employees, but also, also to their shareholders, to their owners. If you've got 850 corporations in which, in which the CEO and the board of directors are manipulating, cheating, and lying about the date that stock options were being issued, in the name of shareholder capitalism, you've got a basic moral flaw at the heart of the system. And that's just one of a number of, that's just one of, a number of indicators that it seems to me that, that indicate to us that our capitalist system which I happen to support. I'm, I'm not a socialist. I support capitalism. I've lived under communism. I've seen it. Um, uh, it's gone off track. And it's gone off track. And one of the measures of it is the inequality. One of the measures of it is the concentration of power. To suggest for a moment that Kentucky hosiery goes and negotiates with $350 billion a year Walmart to sell its uh, socks and there's sort of an equal, uh, e each party is free to pursue its, its fulfillment in the same way, is ignoring the enormous leverage that the Walmart has to suggest that the first time borrower and homeowner who walks into a Washington Mutual and gets told what he can do or she can do in order to get a mortgage loan, and in fact the mortgage broker is giving them a bad loan, misleading them about the terms of the loan, but guiding them through the process to suggest that they are each one equally able to live and fulfill uh, their, their ability to enjoy life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness is to ignore, ignore power realities. Power realities affect the way people can behave. And the examples that I cited 
about the banks manipulating LIBOR. And I don't believe for a moment they were just thinking about it casually and what's your rate going to be. They were looking intensely closely at what the 0.001% would do to the hedge funds uh, CDOs that they were going to dump on the market the next day. They were looking at very practical terms. The same thing as to those, the mortgage agreements. J.P. Morgan has now signed an agreement in which it admits it did wrong. The banks are not signing off on those big agreements because it's just cheaper and easier not to fight the government. They did something wrong, and they know they did something wrong. And that, that is a, there's a pervasive loss of ethics. There's a pervasive loss of trust in our society um, that, ref, that is largely reflective of the greed push in the economy. I'm pushed just to go back to one simple statement that was uttered about a century ago by a very wise man, Louis Brandeis, who was an advisor to President Wilson. And he, what he was suggesting was that concentrated economic power is the greatest threat to our democracy. Concentrated economic power in the private sector. We Americans are always against concentrated power. What strikes me about Yaron's comments tonight is he's only con interested in the concentrated power of government power. Yes, it is coercive, and there are lots of times when government oversteps. But concentrated economic power also limits the free choices of lots of people throughout our economy and throughout our society. And what Lewis... <laughs> And what Louis Brandeis said you should take home with you tonight, and judging by the way this audience has responded, I suspect there are a bunch of you who didn't come to hear this and won't go away taking this away, but I'm going to say it anyway. I got 25 Twitters from the Ayn Rand Foundation to be sure to show up at this meeting tonight, so I've got an idea who's here. Um, <laughs> Uh, and, and why some of the questions were asked the way they were asked. But let's set that aside and remember what Brandeis said. Brandeis said very simply, we must make a choice. We can either have democracy or we can have wealth concentrated in the hands of a few. But we can't have both. Ladies and gentlemen, that is right where we are in America today. And if you want to buy Aaron's argument, you're going to get greater concentration of wealth. He loves inequality. And it's going to hurt the country in the end. And it's going to hurt our civilization. We're going to go into decline if we pursue that line.